The device we're talking about potentially delivering is this device called the Watchman device. Um, it's a sort of an umbrella shaped device. Um, think of the appendage as a little pouch that sits here. And this device basically comes in here, the feet are in the device, and it covers the ostium into it. So it basically closes it off. To deliver this device, we have to come up the vein on, in the, from the groin, come across the inner atrial septum, make a little hole through it, put a sheet through it, and deliver the device. That's simple enough. I mean, it's not. So let's see if you can actually see it. So what we use this device is to sort of teach people how to do transeptal punctures. So to do transeptal punctures, you essentially have this transeptal sheath device many, many, many years ago. So when we teach this, we sort of use this model to sort of look at a couple of things. Typically when you teach the transeptal puncture, what you want your operators to do is you put the device in the IVC, which is the vein that drains into the right atrium. So you come from the, uh, you come from the IVC and you go to the vein above the SVC. And then as you drag your sheath back, it first drops into the, into the right atrium and then it drops into the fossa, which is a thin portion of the septum. So you teach people to look on fluoro and teach those two drops. We can actually show those two drops on a 3D model. We can actually use that and so they can get a sense of what we're talking about. So essentially you start with your sheath in the SVC. You'll see one drop and another drop. We can just move it down a little bit. And now I'm in the fossa. And in the fossa by turning this counterclockwise or clockwise, I can go anterior or posterior. And somewhere in there is a hole. I think it's pre-made. I don't know if I'm going to be able to find it today, but maybe I will. And maybe across. Maybe. Certainly looks appealing. So that, that is the first step of the procedure, which is to do transeptal. Come into the left atrium. Once we've done that, the next step is to get our devices in. And uh, I don't know if we'll be able to get this device in. It's a fairly large device meant for this. It's really not sized for it. This thing is made out of nitinol, so it kind of folds in. So the sheath is kind of messed up, but yeah, it's kind of accordioning out, so yes. it's kind of messed up. We may not be able to deliver the device because we these things are uh, these things are about $30,000 that the company is a little reluctant to give us too many of these. Um, so here's our septum. So essentially what the next step would be to take um, a device, li uh, this is a pigtail catheter which we use to inject some contrast. Um, I have a wire here, this is a wire, so I'll take this one here. So what I have across in the left atrium right now is only a transeptal sheath. It's not what we use to deliver the device. The sheath is actually, the device is delivered through a bigger sheath, a 14 French sheath, which is about this size. So what we would typically do is we go ahead and put in a stiff wire across. I'm not using the big, bigger sheath in here, but we can essentially use this. Can you move this down just a little bit? And we can find the appendage using this, this sort of this steerable catheter. We'll kind of move it up, find the appendage, and find a good spot, take some pictures, get a good size measurement, and then we go ahead and deliver the device. Um, 
which is here. I can't show you the delivery of the device, but um, so you can use this device sort of really to practice the entire procedure from beginning to end. And if you want to be very specific to the individual patient, you can actually have this model created for that patient. So we can, for example, get CTAs of that individual patient and look at their appendage, size it, and be able to try a couple of different sizes and say which one is better. Because sometimes you're sort of in this clinical gray zone. You know, is this a better for a 30 millimeter device or a 33? Like the case I was giving you an example of, I thought by the echocardiogram that I had that a 33 millimeter device would be just perfect. Tried the 33 twice, didn't quite work because um, if, you, if you just think about it, there's a little tissue that's kind of pushing, grabbing onto it. But if you have over compression near the feet, remember the heart is squeezing. This is ejecting it outwards. So that's what happened. We had still attached to the cable. We do a little tug test, not stable enough. It just came right out. So we actually undersized so that we get better apposition without over compression. We can do a lot of that in a, in a model like this. You can tailor your tissue because you can you get multi-material printing. So for example, in the mitral valve, the mitral annulus when we are dealing with it is often calcified. It's very, very hard. So you're trying to deliver a device it may be very easy to deliver it in a normal heart, but you're not dealing with a normal heart. You're dealing with a heart that's calcified. So they were able to create for us a calcified model, hard material. So we were able to go ahead and deliver a valve and see how does it sit in that abnormal pathological heart. And it really helped in, de in, in actually deciding how to approach the whole case. Uh, we're going to be presenting this at TCT uh, in two weeks' time. Uh, showing the rest of the world how we think 3D printing is helpful. For me, I will not do any more mitral cases, native mitrals, without 3D printing. I mean, it just is, it's risky enough that you want to put yourself, give yourself the best odds of success in a case like that, you know. Um, so we think it's very helpful. In a case for Watchman's, for the typical Watchman cases, is this something you should do for every case? I don't know yet. I don't know the answer yet because the answer to that, unfortunately, in today's world is not based upon safety efficacy, it's based upon healthcare economics. It will depend upon whether you can do this cheaply, efficiently, effectively, all of those things. And I think when we get to that spot, I, I see no reason why every case shouldn't have its own 3D printed model if the cost is, is reasonable, wherein you can actually go ahead and try it. It also gives me a lot of flexibility. I have trainees who are coming in to do these procedures we have never done one. You know, I don't want them to necessarily be practicing on a patient the first time. Neither does the patient for that matter. You know, on the other hand, we can have them do parts of the procedure independently, but do an entire procedure on a 3D printed model where they get more comfortable doing these procedures.